Thanks, Katja. Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for having me and not just asking ChatGPT what is the advancement of AI and toxicology, because that's where we are heading, actually, I think. Um, I have the privilege to be the founding editor, chief editor of Frontiers in Artificial Intelligence, and I'm following very much, very closely, where AI is explosively disrupting our life at the moment. Um, I made my slides available, and I also try not to be too much overlapping with the presentation I'm giving tomorrow on the same topic. Um, so this is the toxicological world. Um, it is very much a terra incognita. Um, 350,000 chemicals have been registered in the 19 most developed countries, 350,000. And probably 1% of this is really well studied with comprehensive assessments. And we know about some monsters, and some of them are imagined, <laughs> and we are really struggling with this very much. Um, AI is promising to help us with these tools because AI is making big sense of big data. Um, some people have said uh, data is the new oil, um, and I would like to add that AI is then the new combustion engine. It is really making sense of these data. The, um, it is the fastest accepted technology. Uh, what we have seen is that uh, when GPT-3.5 came out, 400 million people have tried it out within the first two months. 400 million people. But this number is actually quite interestingly contrasted that uh, as soon as a paid version of this became available, GPT-4, um, it is only 4 million people who are using this. Despite the fact that GPT-4 is 10 times more powerful and interestingly, only 400,000, so 0.1% of the users are using the full capacity of plugins like uh, internet connections. So they are staying, usually even if they have a paid plan, with the knowledge of September 2021 when these systems have been trained. So there's still a lot of wrong assessments of what these technologies can actually do for us. Um, they're helping us in a supervised or unsupervised way um, to bring order into data. Um, so if it's about human and dogs or toxic or non-toxic, that's the type of distinction they're helping us. And in one case, um, supervised, they help us to distinguish between the very similar looking men and dogs. Um, if it is um, autonomous clustering, an unsupervised approach, it is trying to say these are similar. And then we have suddenly some cases where it's difficult to say, is it a human is it a, um, or is it a dog? Is it toxic or is it not toxic? But still, some interesting results come from these type of clustering approaches. Okay, um, let's take a 10,000 foot perspective for a moment. Science has worked over centuries by moving us from belief, experience, and some observations to a hypothesis. And this hypothesis then is experimentally um, tried uh, to find causation and proof. And what we're seeing is that there is two different developments taking place. On the one hand, we have the evidence-based methods, which are trying to help us to do this in a more orderly way. It is reducing all of the information to the most relevant data. And I think in short, we can say an evidence-based approach, like evidence-based medicine, is the best humans can do in objectively and transparently handling the information which is around. AI, machine learning, is working completely differently. It is not reducing the data, but it is trying to fill in as much data as possible. We are working with big data. And it is the best a machine can do. Um, it is doing something which is quite incredible. It is integrating enormous amounts of information, but not with the certainty of the best selected information, but with the highest probability of coming to result. And digesting much more information than we can do. Uh, my overall take home message is that I believe we have to combine these two approaches. We have to tell the machines how to look for quality, how to bring relevance into the system, because uh, the danger of garbage in, garbage out is always there. Uh, but it is still, um, it is only a question of who is identifying the garbage. And when a human can identify the garbage, a machine can too.
But this is a step which is lacking. Um, medicine um, has already very old, uh, very, uh, very early been described as an art of probability. So William Osler is one of the iconics of, um, of Hopkins who phrased this term. Um, and actually the Cochrane collaboration uh, and evidence-based medicine have taken this up. This is an editorial, evidence-based medicine, a science of uncertainty and art of probability. There is this editorial, which I found really uh, quite fitting. And if you look, the symbol of the Cochrane collaboration is actually a probability blot. Um, what is showing here is a forest plot of probabilities from various studies. So evidence-based medicine from its inception has been started to work with probabilities. And this is exactly the output of AI systems. So this garbage in, garbage out thing, the question is only who is sorting the garbage. The Ontox project, and Mathieu Winken here is our coordinator, is trying to bring this on scale. We are trying to explore what an enormous input, all available data, can help us to distill some meaning. It is not to develop a tool which is replacing current procedures, but it is trying to develop a co-pilot, a tool which is meant to produce on a silver platter a suggested evidence integration, but most of all, it is an evidence retrieval tool. It is trying to find what we have, and this for some systemic toxicities. It is based on data, retrieval and integration. And the first of these is um, what Tom Lichtefeld, research associate of mine, but most importantly, the CEO and founder of ToxTrack and in Silica, two AI companies, has been developing as SysRef. SysRef, as the name indicates, was a tool, developed as a tool for systematic reviews. And it is using uh, AI machine learning to support systematic reviews. It is freely available in a public version and has been used for more than 10,000 systematic review projects. So if you're interested in the main tool of evidence-based medicine and evidence-based toxicology, I very much recommend to you, uh, you go into sysref.com. In the context of the Ontox project, we are now bringing in also data extraction tools, um, natural entity recognition, causal relationships. So we are trying to take this out of the identified articles and feed them into our further processing. Um, so this is an, some, is an example here. What you can see is how, um, I don't think I have a laser pointer, uh, what you can see here is how with an increasing number of training on abstracts, you find better and better um, learning of the system and it is after 100 to 200 articles typically as good as a second human reviewer in identifying the articles to be included. And then it can run on thousands of others and is identifying really um, very nicely uh, articles. Uh, this is work by the Ontox Consortium. You can see how humans here are labeling, are tagging articles for the different questions we have and helping by doing so uh, to form a basis to optimize our processes and extract the relevant data for the questions on liver, kidney and the developing brain toxicity. Um, interestingly, uh, the large language models, uh, which are at the moment dominating our perception of AI, are getting better and better in reading scientific papers. Um, I don't know whether you noticed in February of this year, Windows released BioGPT, which is a system based on GPT-4, but pre-trained for biomedical literature. And the interesting fact is that BioGPT is better than a human in annotating scientific papers. Or simply said, it is better in reading scientific papers than your PhD student, but it's not reading a single paper per week. It's reading millions as you like it, and it's not forgetting anything about it. So it is probably um, a situation in time where we are the last generation which really learned to write a scientific paper from scratch. Um, it is something which is increasingly going to the machines and integrating these things. And it's more a question of access to this information, um, publishing openly and machine readable, uh, which is really limiting at the moment that scientific knowledge is used to be mined. Besides uh, the SysRef uh, data stream, 
We have a second data stream, which is uh, BioBricks. <coughs> BioBricks is a way of making um, large databases importable um, in, within minutes, uh, independent of any knowledge of the structure of the database and the, and the programming language. And uh, we have produced now, if I say we, this is Tom Lichtefeld, as I said, he's 50% part of my team, with funding by ONTOX, funding by the NIEHS and the National Science Foundation in the US. He has created for the 50 most important um, databases in public health this import tool, and we are going to make them all jointly available shortly. So this is integrating all of the databases, not only the scientific literature. And the third tool he has developed is a meta crawler called ChemChart, which is getting the gray information from the internet. And interestingly, we found, for example, more than 900,000 safety data sheets in the internet. Um, this is not the best and highest level scientific information, but it's better than nothing for many. And it is gray literature, which can help because in this way of integration, um, also weak data are better than no data. And this is then the starting point for us to integrate. And here, um, the remarkable ability of uh, AI systems to analyze and put out a probability for making a pre prediction is really important. And the ability to do this multimodally on various types of information, because AI is not shining with one large data set of one property, it is shining when you have many different types of data on the very same set of chemicals. Um, so this is developing, uh, this is feeding first of all in some of our developments about automated read across. Automated read across, RASA, is a way of uh, using network effects on multiple properties. Uh, we had a major publication on this in 2018, where we showed already for 190,000 cases where we had a chemical and a classification uh, that we were 87% correct in predicting these. 190,000 cases, which was favorable uh, in comparison to the animal test data, which were only around 81% reproducible for the very same endpoints. In the meantime, we have been able to show that it is also um, very good in predicting human outcomes, in this case, human skin sensitization. Um, human skin sensitization was predicted with around 80% um, quality, human data with the system, while the local lymph node assay, for example, is only 74% predictive of human outcomes. So again, showing for a quite reasonable data set, uh, good performance. Since we are in the Food Safety Authority here, um, I put up another study which we published last year, where we simply showed we can apply this to massive data. We used an uh, inventory of 4,700 um, chemicals, which are food relevant in the US, and we carried out the equivalent of 38,000 studies studies in animals, which would cost more than $250 million if you would run them, if you would have find the capacity to run that many animal experiments. And again, for a small subset of 139 chemicals, we gave it a look and we saw 83% accurate predictions in this. And this shows you that we can actually predict essentially for the chemical universe, if we only want, within hours, predict the outcome of these animal tests. So the next step, here you see some of the data, um, I don't want to go into any level of detail. These are nine OECD guideline test equivalents, which were predicted. Um, the paper is out. Uh, you can identify and read about it. Uh, it is quite interesting to see that this is possible all over. Um, the next level is now to bring not only chemical similarity into the game, but also biological similarity because we need to understand that these chemicals are not only structurally uh, related, they're also related by the type of effects they are having. And biological similarity um, allowed us about 80% accurate predictions um, of 152 properties. Uh, you have to imagine 152 properties were all predicted with about 80% um, um, accuracy uh, by using one of the data sets we have developed uh, within the ONTOX project. 
At the moment, we are just limited by computational power. We only used about a million data points of a total of 200 million data points, which we uh, obtained by combining eight of the leading databases that we have. So we are expecting that this predictive capacity of the system will actually be dramatically increased. And quite interestingly, you can turn this now around. You can ask the AI to suggest compounds, whether they exist or could be synthesized, which have properties which are characterized from these 152 uh, which we have chosen. We can simply ask, give us something which has these chemical physical properties, which has these biological activities, which has these structural features. So this is really changing a game changer, for example, for alternative chemistries. Um, this data integration has a lot of opportunities. It is obviously to predict adverse effects of target type of effects, suggest biomarkers, um, help us with interspecies differences in adverse pathways. So there's a lot of the dream list of the wish list for Christmas uh, a toxicologist might, might have. Um, <clears throat> this is a Baltimorean. Um, Henry Mencken, and he said something which I liked a lot. For every complex problem, there's an answer that is clear, simple, and wrong. <laughs> and uh, I think this is a very good description of how we do toxicology normally. Because the main problem I'm seeing is that we are living in a world which is black and white. Where for each and every of these properties, we want something which is toxic, non-toxic, carcinogenic, not carcinogenic, and so on. While reality is a lot of shades of gray, and these shades of gray come with enormous uncertainties. And this is um, something we have to understand. At any point in time, we have, based on our observations, predictions, and decisions, we have a certain, we are moving from ignorance to certainty. But there's always something left. There's a part left which is based on the imprecision of our measurements, which we can improve, the lacks of knowledge. But there's always also an irreducible uncertainty because you're working with models. And it's really about um, how far can we come to certainty. It is always only a probability which we will obtain. And um, I think that looking into probabilities of hazard, into probabilities of risk, is actually what we really need to change. Because then it is, first of all, the necessary answer to the proliferation in tools we are observing in toxicology, a lot of things which are not giving the exact same result, but which we have to combine, and which combined only deliver a certain probability. So it is really about changing from the deterministic to the probabilistic approaches, which is going to help us here. And uh, we have, in the context of the ONTOX project, digged out again the ideas of probabilistic risk assessments, which have been around for many decades since the 40s of the last century. This was the leading uh, risk as analysis tool in some engineering disciplines. We carried out workshops now because we see this as really a novel tool which now enhanced by AI can help us. A probabilistic risk assessment only becomes beautiful through AI because it suddenly turns from something which is a very demanding, uh, requiring mathematical skill type of approaches where we lack data to something where the data can be computed or at least retrieved and we can start using the capacities of these AI systems to derive probabilities. And what we are trying to do within the ONTOX project is to feed the data, first of all, into biological systems, biological, physiological maps, into adverse outcome pathway type of systems, and then to complement the structure-based probabilities to a probability of hazard from the perturbation of physiology we're observing. Um, the good question is, do we really want this? <laughs> uh, be because imagine um, toxicology is a business. Toxicology is about four billion per year for animal studies. Um, if we could predict the outcome of these animal studies with reasonable accuracy, uh, we probably would find that half of the chemical universe is carcinogenic. Can you imagine what happens when we are starting to uh, lay out that all the stuff we have been using in the past is actually uh, probably, or a lot of this is carcinogenic? 72% uh, of 32 ingredients of coffee have been proven to be carcinogenic. Apply this to all of the ingredients we know, 
um, we will have problems. This is just the thought starter. If we really make uh, on mass uh, predictions of high quality available. Um, this is why I think we really have to think as AI, as a co-pilot, uh, as something which is helping us at the moment to really obtain the information available and get some suggestions how to integrate this so that we gain more and more experience. And with AI doubling its capacity every three months, so making it about eight to ten times more powerful within a year, we have to expect a lot. We're just scratching on the surface of what these systems can offer us, but they should be used as a co-pilot as soon as possible in order to improve our processes and finally make use of all of the information we have accumulated in the past. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas, Dr. Thomas Arting, for this uh, inspiring uh, presentation. And uh, we will keep the question uh, for uh, later. So we will uh, collect uh, all the questions uh, for the Q&A session at the end of uh, this uh, three presentation. And now I'm uh, pleased uh, to introduce you, Dr. Akosha Woshviak. Wosh Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> so currently he serves as a head of the department of uh, digital uh, food science at the Institute of uh, Food Chain Science, University of Veterinary Medicine in Budapest. He's also a member uh, of EFSA Advisory Forum and EFSA Emerging Risk Exchange Networks. And he's also the chair of the EFSA Advisory Group on Data. His research activities uh, focus on developing and applying a new data analytics method for improving the effectiveness of the control of the food safety systems. And uh, today, Dr. Woshviak, bless <laughs> Reichen, <laughs> will uh, talk uh, about a prerequisite for uh, data analytics and artificial uh, intelligence. Please, uh, Dr. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Akos Juzviak, and I'm not blaming anyone, not pronouncing it. It's half Hungarian, half Polish, so that's the starting point. Okay, so I, I think I will take forward what Thomas was telling us and um, uh, to come to a, I think, very similar conclusion from another angle, from member states' angle, authority angle, and research angle in practice. So this is what I will be talking today about, that we need, yeah, we need more AI. And do we want to clean the data or do the dirty job? Uh, and in many cases, the answer is no. And let's see what, uh, what we have to have to do data analytics or, or to uh, train AI models or to use them in our decision making processes. Obviously, we need data collections, we need data modeling, architecture, some kind of data analytic tools, we need all the stakeholders. But what we also need, we need data and we need people to operate this whole thing. And I, I would like to talk about these two aspects uh, today. Uh, what is the situation with the data and the people running the whole thing? When it comes to data, obviously everyone knows about the different quality dimensions of data, um, which Obviously, we still have to work on in many cases, but also there are other questions which are very rarely talked about, about the quantity of the data which we have, what the data which we have for training or for or any kind of analysis, uh, what they really represent, what, how interoperable the data collections are, can we use in practice, can we use different data sets or not? And in from a very practical angle, these are quite big burdens to jump over for most of the research communities, most of the authorities. And of course, there are institutions which have a lot of capacities or large capacities, big infrastructure, and they could easily uh, run around these obstacles. But for many of us, these are very practical problems. So what I would like to present today is some sort of an outcome of many years of discussion in the advisory group on data of EFSA, which is a collection of member state experts, and we try to come up with recommendations to EFSA, to member states, on what to do with the data. It kind of serves as a think tank for EFSA in, in, in uh, outlining or drafting their strategy related to data. 
and also it helps ourselves to understand what is the current situation. So I'm here to tell all about all the outcomes of these discussions in relation to these questions. So first example which I brought with me today is the missing data. This is a normal problem, I would say a normal procedure in science that we, we, we miss a lot of data, we miss a lot of details, but we tend to forget about it. Uh, one of the projects which we just uh, launched in Hungary is uh, a small pilot on foodom, the molecular level composition of food, where the reality is when we want to predict or want to assess what effects the foods have on our human physiology or biochemistry, we practically don't know because we don't know what chemical components are in the foods precisely. We know the macronutrients, we know a lot. This is just an example that, for instance, in case of garlic, around 150 components are traced by the USDA database. But what we know that there are more than 130,000 different chemicals might be in general and in garlic 67 versus uh, more than 5,000. And we don't really know what uh, what is the concentration of these 5,000, how often they are in garlic. So it's very hard to make mechanistic co connections between human health outcomes and eating garlic or eating anything. And this is true for many of the instances, many of the problems which we which we research that we don't have the underlying data. We don't have access to this data. Also, there is kind of a problem when you have the data collected by someone else, like in, we are in EFSA, uh, all the member states are collecting data through different monitoring and surveillance programs in relation to food, chemical uh, contaminants, uh, microbiological contaminants, and so on. These are reported to EFSA. There are data which we could use for risk assessment for, for many other purposes. But the point is that these data are collected through these different programs. And when you do the sampling, there are multiple ways of doing the sampling. Um, one is to do a random or objective sampling. The other way is to use your risk uh, knowledge on, uh, and to do a risk-based sampling and so on. And many of these samplings, are they do have statistically limited interpretability and they lead to biased results. And we know about this, um, but also we know about different challenges which we face. There are many questionable reporting practices. There are many questions around how to report a data point which was planned centrally as a random sampling program, but at the very local level, the sampling officer was taking the sample on a risk basis. What is it? How, how statistically interpretable it is? Also, we know that there are sampling programs which are inherently biased in a way, like the veterinary drug residue sampling programs. We tend to forget about this. And um, also in the advisory group on data, we try to advocate to discuss at least these issues and to move forward and to come up with some sort of solutions to these, at least guidance documents, if we cannot come up with something more powerful. But still, this is an issue in everyday life. Also, when there are data and we know more or less what they represent, uh, then it comes to interoperability. This is a good example. It will be not a good example in a few months or years because they are currently working on it, but still this is a nice example. Um, the European Commission is collecting data on, on the rapid alert uh, system for food and feed. And if there is an outbreak, they are working together with EFSA on a rapid risk assessment. But can we automatically and quickly link RASF data with EFSA data on contaminants and, and consumption. And currently not. These are in different formats. Different categorization is used for the foods and for the hazards. And it's not an automatic link between the two. And of course, it's a solvable issue. You could link it manually. You could use AI um, or any other uh, uh, translation tables and so on. But still, it is a problem which is a missed opportunity in, in another way because it could be really solved by using at least interoperable uh, categorization systems. And we have a lot more. So this is just an example. And we have more and more and more of these since many of the authorities and institutions are running their own collection, data collection programs. And uh, we are facing inherently with, the, with these kinds of um, challenges. Also, when we more or less know what the different databases represent and we know that the data are there or the whole system is interoperable with others, or at least it's, cl at least it's claimed that it's interoperable with others, then still there are minor and important differences 
which prohibit us from using these data sets very easily or conveniently for research purposes. One good example is the classification of foods, which is an evergreen problem, very long lasting. Uh, currently, EFSA has done a tremendous job in, in uh, uh, elaborating or developing the Foodex tool, but it's not used by the research community because it's not accessible through standard ontologies. And the number one choice, at least here in Europe, is the food on categorization of foods for research. And I think it's not good for EFSA because they did a tremendous job of developing Foodex too. But still, a research community is not very much jumping on it because it's not accessible through any free access standardized ontology formats. And uh, it, for research, there is no use of using this. And there are other numerous examples where we miss ontologies. We miss standardized classification systems. A good example, at least I'm a vet, so I was very much interested in pulling off a international ontology of animal diseases similar to human diseases. And we don't have this. This is a gray area not yet developed. And again, it prolongs the time needed and the efforts needed to just have the data, the proper data for our research or policy purposes. Um, and then we, when we are after all of these, then we are coming to the point when we want to have machine readable data. We have a problem formulation. This is an example from, from another research of ours. It's a drug repositioning project where we try to come up and combine different data on feed, feed components, feed additives, together with some uh, drug databases and chemical ontologies, chemical databases, when we realize that even though we have European regulation on feed additives, we have a very long uh, PDF published by the European Commission on all these components in the feed additives, we don't have machine readable data. It's a huge job and task to crawl through different information embedded in subsequent PDFs, which is a doable, of course, a solvable problem, and it could lead to very nice research. But most of our time, 80% of our time goes for these kinds of efforts. And this is the practical reality that if we want to make more data-based, AI-based, data science-based research or policy uh, intervention planning or any kind of decision making, we in practice struggle with these kinds of problems. Um, this is the data part. And there is the people part, which I don't want to talk very long about, but we all know that now there is a kind of a paradigm shift. And we cannot expect all our experts to be data scientists at the same time. However, what we see as a near future is that experts, domain experts, without the knowledge on data or without data literacy, they will be kind of out of business very soon. So what we need is to embrace more data science in even in, in education and, and curricula of, uh, of university courses, which is currently not the case for food science and veterinary sciences. So we don't have, we have statistics, but we don't have data science. And um, we need it very quickly. So what we can do, and this is kind of a summary of, of the recommendations of the advisor group on data. So we need, in certain cases, in certain areas and domains, we need to invest in data generation. So it seems to be a very low level thing just to have proper data in proper places, interoperable and downloadable and accessible in, in, in a fashion which is described by many people with fair principles and so on. But still we, we miss a lot of um, domain data to be ready for analysis. Also we need to invest in building ontologies because this is kind of a way forward. Maybe not for everything, but there are certainly areas where we need this. Also sharing tools, methodologies, models, data, opening it up, sharing for the research community and sharing with the authorities. This is also uh, a set of recommendations. Another interesting aspect is the publishing and open data standards where we tend to forget about that from a statistical or mathematical perspective, the data of the failed trials, the negative results are very important. Even they are more important than the successful ones. And these are not published usually. There is no repository for these kinds of data. It, When you come across such data, 
they are really powerful in uh, training the models, in uh, using in your analysis. So this is something which we tend to forget about. And it, when we come to a situation where we will use more and more machine learning and AI and probabilistic approaches, then these kinds of information, this is what we will be missing the most. And we need education. We need, as I said, uh, include data science and data literacy early on, which is not in our hands, but even though I would say in primary schools and so on and so forth, but certainly in higher education, we need more skilled people, more data literate people. And obviously we need change management, which is not a surprising uh, thing here, but maybe the hardest to pull off how you transform an institution to a data driven organization. Uh, from an outsider, I see that FSA is doing uh, a lot of things around this, and this is something good, a good direction, serves as a blueprint for other member state institutions. But this is hard to do, uh, how, how you change your thinking and to stop doing the old paradigm thing and uh, how to embrace the new. Um, so thank you very much for your attention, and I will be here to, to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> it was uh, very important for us uh, to receive also the view from a regulatory agency perspective. Uh, I mean, many challenges, uh, but uh, also good suggestion on, uh, on a possible uh, solution. So thank you very much uh, for your presentation. And now I would uh, like to introduce you to the last speaker of uh, today, Professor Matthew Winken. He currently holds the position of full professor at Evria University in Brussels, in Belgium. And in addition, he has a role as a professor uh, and serves uh, as a current chair of uh, in vitro and in silico toxicology specialty section uh, of uh, Eurotox project. And uh, today, uh, Professor Winkel will uh, provide us uh, insight on ONTOX, ontology-driven and artificial intelligence-based uh, repeated dose toxicity testing of chemicals for uh, next generation risk assessment. ONTOX is a groundbreaking initiative that promises to deliver a strategy for uh, new approaches uh, to methodologies. And uh, I will invite you to come to the floor. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Yes, that's the first slide. So first of all, of course, I would like to thank uh, the organizers. It's a, a very nice opportunity for me as ONTOX coordinator to talk about uh, ONTOX. So yeah, that's exactly the goal of today's uh, concise presentation, I would say. So what I would like to do is to give you some background on ONTOX and then in the next step also to show you some of our first results. Actually, uh, ONTOX started in uh, May 21 for a five years period and its goal as you can see on this first slide is pretty ambitious it's to develop an animal free and human relevant strategy for the prediction of chemical induced uh, toxicity so of course we only had five years actually we still have two and a half years because we are almost halfway so that's why we had to set priorities at the start of ontox and this is exactly what we have done what you can see on the slide so we decided to focus on uh, systemic repeated dose toxicity for obvious reasons, because we all know that this still uses, uh, let's say, a majority of laboratory animals. We also decided to focus on three uh, target organs, namely the liver, the kidney and the brain, and uh, particularly the developing brain. And why is that? Because we do know that these organs are very frequently targeted by chemicals and repeated dose toxicity. And within those three target organs, we have uh, defined two adversities to focus on. So this means that we have six case studies in total in ONTOX. And today, further in the presentation, I would like to show you some of the results with respect to the liver case study. So that would be steatosis, the accumulation of fat, and also cholestasis, which is the accumulation of bile. Now, by definition, everything that we develop in ONTOX should be so-called chemical agnostic, which means that it should be applicable to any kind of chemical or applicability domain. But for a, a number of reasons, mainly pragmatic reasons, we do prioritize uh, drugs, cosmetics, biocides, and food ingredients. But this is absolutely not set in stone. So basically, we try to test whatever kind of chemical, if you will. 
And because of time restrictions, I will not dwell uh, on the driving principles because I assume that all of you are familiar with this. Well, I always say that Ontox is a very pragmatic kind of project. So what do I mean with this? Well, we don't claim to be the next kind of project that will come up with another fancy in vitro system, no. We try to make as much as we can use of what is already out there. And that specifically holds for data. And then the remaining data gaps are being filled by very specific and targeted in vitro testing and in silico modeling. And to achieve this goal, we have a quite elaborate toolbox available that consists, as you can see, of human data and biological material. Obviously, in vitro methods, uh, whether or not combined with stem cell technology, and last but certainly not least, of course, in silico methods with a main focus on artificial intelligence. So what do we want to get out of Ontox at the end of the five years period? Well, first and foremost, we want to provide proof of concept, which has already has been explained in part in Thomas' presentation. So what do we want to get out of this? It's really this six new approach methodologies, NAMS, for each of the six case studies. I think that most of you are aware that these days the definition of a NAM is a very hot topic uh, and that's why it is very clear also in the context of Ontox to be clear on what a NAM is. And this is illustrated to you on this slide. So a NAM, at least an Ontox, cons consists of an artificial intelligence system that is coupled with an in vitro and in silico test battery. And as mentioned, we want to set up a NAM for each of the six case studies. Now, uh, artificial intelligence really is what we call the methodological cornerstone in, uh, in Ontox. We have a work package that is only focused on uh, artificial intelligence, and that, by the way, is led by Thomas. And just in a nutshell, we do use artificial intelligence in Ontox for two purposes, which is also shown here on this slide. So the first one is all about collecting data, or big data, as we heard. We are particularly interested in data that relate to the biology, the toxicology, the physical chemistry and the kinetics. And why is that? Because we know that this is essential information for systemic repeated dose toxicity. And we gather all of this information in what we call an ontology. And I will be coming back to this in a second. And as already explained also in Thomas' presentation, we do consider, you know, quite different uh, sources, safety dossiers, databases, of course, uh, the vast majority of information that we retrieved thus far is from scientific uh, papers, if you will. And to do this in a structured way, we have implemented three of these uh, data collection or visualization tools, if you will, uh, which is also shown to you here on this slide. Now, the very premise of Ontox is to go back to the biological basics, which is a, a step that is very frequently ignored in these kind of initiatives. So what does that mean? So when you define the ontology, the adversity, you should already have a very good idea to what kind of physiological function this actually corresponds. And this is the very basis for this physiological map. So that's all about mapping you know, like the, the mechanisms of that physiological function, which also will allow you to identify any data gaps. And this then serves in the second step for uh, mapping the mechanisms of the corresponding adverse situation under the form of an AOP, an adverse outcome pathway. And if you consider multiple starting points, endpoints, that will be an AOP network. And as you can appreciate from the slide, so in addition to mechanisms as such, also we consider here clinical epidemiological data. And of course, if you want to quantify an AOP, you need to do things like kinetics, which is also being included here. And then the third step, as you can see here, is the establishment of an ontology. And this differs a bit from what we heard in the previous talk. So it's not a semantic ontology, it's a mode of action ontology, if you will. In practice, at least again in the context of Ontox, this comes down to exactly the same as a QAOP network, with that difference that it additionally takes into consideration the physical chemical properties of the compounds that not only induce the AOP as such, as you will be seeing further on, but also individual key events. And then the second application for artificial intelligence in uh, Ontox is what also already was mentioned by Thomas, is to make sense out of the data. So we want to create a kind of a signature, if you will, for each of the six uh, case studies. And the main technique here is machine learning. We heard about the RASR approach and so on. And the remainder of the presentation, I will only focus on the first application, so the collection of data, because this is what we are still doing. We are still, you know, getting everything started up 
for making sense out of it, so to say. So I would like to show you an example of these physiological maps, QAOP networks and ontologies. And as mentioned, um, because of time restrictions, I would like to focus on the liver case studies, steatosis and cholestasis. Well, this is the physiological map uh, of uh, liver lipid metabolism. Uh, good luck to you, because this is probably very hard to read. Uh, this is uh, designed by cell designer. Uh, it's just to show to you, you know, the, the, the level of detail, the granularity actually that we focus on. So you can see just on the uh, left hand side, a magnification of one part really showing to you that we go all up to you know, the gene level. And as mentioned, this is the liver lipid metabolism um, physiological map, which is a kind of the homeostatic or the physiological predecessor, if you will, for uh, steatosis, which will be addressed further on. We did the very same thing here also for liver bile acid metabolism, which then further corresponds with cholestasis. Again, I will not go into the details here. Um, so you see the whole map on you know, the right-hand side, and of course, this is a dynamic uh, map. This is, you know, continue to be updated, if you will, with any relevant new information. And just uh, for demonstration purposes, uh, a magnification on the left hand side. So that is the physiological map. Uh, so remember that then the next step is to actually look at the adverse situation under the form of AOPs. And in the case of steatosis and cholestasis, we were quite lucky because we didn't have to start from, from scratch. I mean, there were already some AOPs out there when you started uh, on talk. So the first thing that we did is we embedded them in what we call an AOP network. So it's not a linear AOP with one start point, one end point, with multiple starting points, and also in some cases, multiple uh, end points, as you can see here. Now, um, the main tool that we actually used for this purpose was also already explained uh, by Thomas. Uh, this is where artificial intelligence has played a very important role, namely SysRef. Uh, I don't have the time to go through all of this in detail. Actually, uh, what you see here on this slide is currently under revision at the journal. So hopefully in a couple of weeks or so, uh, you will be able to you know, have full access to this. What you see on the right hand side gives a bit of a, of a summary of what we actually did. So for each of the case studies, we have gathered experts around this. So the people, as we heard in the previous uh, presentation. So in this case, there were about 10 people with in-depth knowledge on liver steatosis. At the same time, we also in PubMed or Medline, we have identified all of the relevant papers that could help to optimize you know, the uh, AOP network, if you will. And we are talking about, as you can see, more than 12,000 scientific papers. So what we have done is that about 10% of those papers have been, you know, uh, treated, so to say, manually by the experts. So they really extracted all of the relevant information and the labeling was also done, as explained by Thomas, for about 10% of the papers. And at the same time, we have shown the machine on how to do that. So the machine learning aspect. And then the remainder of the, um, all of the papers was then left over to the computer. And actually the result of all of this, and we are talking about one year work, so of course not full time, but you can imagine how intensive that was. The result of this is shown here on this slide, and this may seem very trivial, but I can assure you that there is a lot of work and also a lot of information that is being hidden behind all of these you know, boxes and so on and so forth. So we did the very same thing then for cholestasis. And in this case, very happy to say that very recently we have uh, published this paper. It's an open access paper, so everybody can read it if that were to be of uh, interest. We, uh, we followed the very same strategy using SysRef. Uh, what we also did, we also did this for the previous case study, by the way, we took advantage of the opportunity to also visually include the outcome of the assessment according to the so-called tailored Bradford Hill criteria. So people um, you know, that are working on AOPs might be familiar with this. This is the way, uh, the recommended way by OECD to evaluate newly postulated and also uh, optimized uh, AOP or AOP networks, if you will. So we talked about the physiological map. So then we had the uh, AOPs and then next is the ontologies. So as mentioned, we are now halfway in ONTOX. We don't have the ontologies uh, yet. Uh, but this, this just gives you an idea of, of how we actually envisage the ontology. So as mentioned already in the context of um, ONTOX, we are talking about not a semantic, but a mode of action uh, ontology. And in practice, this is exactly the same as the AOP network with that additional difference that it also takes into consideration the physical chemical profile of the compounds that induce not only the AOP as such, but also, you know, like different key events. 
So what we have in mind is a kind of a very interactive tool. You would be able to kind of click, if you will, uh, on the key events, uh, after which you have like a drop-down menu where you have all of the uh, relevant information. So that's what we have in mind. So to end up with, I would like to also illustrate to you on how all of this ontology information and ontologies as such can actually serve the purpose of toxicity screening. So more specifically, hazard identification, which is, is exactly what we want to do, of course, uh, in ONTOX. And as a matter of fact, this uh, is being embedded in a tiered uh, testing strategy, which can be used in an app initio kind of uh, scenario. So suppose that you know, you have like a new molecule, you only have its structure, uh, you have some physical chemical properties, and you would be asked to assess the potential or the probability, as we heard in the first presentation, of that chemical to induce, in this case, steatosis or cholestasis. You're not allowed to use uh, animal testing, you only have access to very limited in vitro testing and some in silico modeling. Good luck to you, so how to do that? Well, the first thing you want to do is just have a look at the structure of the, chemi uh, of the chemical, which already gives you quite some information. You can do things like uh, read across QSAR, um, so that's full in silico kind of assessment. And then the next two tiers fully rely on in vitro testing. Of course, the first step here is to select one or more appropriate uh, liver-based in vitro models, which is uh, very often underestimated, I would say and then to incubate with the chemical under investigation, if you will. And then what you need to do is a kind of a holistic approach. So any kind of omics approach, so you can do proteomics, metabonomics, but of course, most people do transcriptomics, uh, RNA sequencing, whatever. And then to benchmark, if you will, the outcome compared to the AOP network. Now, this works pretty well as a standalone method for lots of toxicity endpoints, including some liver toxicity endpoints. But for the more complex uh, AOPs, if you will, like cholestasis, which has a very pronounced homeostatic adaptive response, using only transcriptomics gives you a predictive value somewhere between 60 or 70 percent. And you can increase this by having this follow, uh, followed up with what we call an, uh, an atomistic approach, which is just a, a very fancy way to say that you are not uh, will be screening at the AOP level, but at the key event level, and also not at the expression level, but preferably at the activity level. And in the next few slides, I would like to show you some of the progress that we recently made uh, in ONTOX with respect to tier two and three, and then again, specifically for the case studies of steatosis and cholestasis. So I mentioned that tier two is all about this omics uh, kind of uh, exercise, if you will, and you can do obviously omics every time that you have to do an app initio <clears throat> kind of study. But what you can also do is to predefine already uh, upfront the number of indicator genes that all together give you um, a good indication, if you will, of that kind of toxicity. This might be the more pragmatic approach, and in some cases, it might also be cheaper if you can use, you know, like a PCR instead of uh, RNA sequencing, for example. And there are quite some ways, actually, to select those genes. Uh, and we have followed two strategies in ONTOX. So the first one for liver steatosis, on this, as uh, shown on this slide, uh, fully relied on expert knowledge. Uh, so we had the experts again, we looked at the AOP, uh, and also we went through some databases manually, and we selected 10 genes that all together give you a very good indication uh, of, you know, uh, of the potential of inducing steatosis, uh, if you will. There is another way uh, which also uses artificial intelligence, and again, very happy to say that we also have very recently published this for the case of cholestasis. So here again, uh, we used at least in part machine learning. Um, we found a lot of databases uh, with cholestasis gene information, if you will. And to make a very long story short, um, well, the machine, if you will, came up with 13 genes that uh, are fully mechanistically anchored in the AOP, and again, that all together give you a very good indication of that particular compound, whether or not it can induce uh, cholestasis. And then finally, tier three, uh, which is all about screening at the key uh, event uh, level. So obviously the first thing that you need to do here is to uh, select the key events from uh, the AOPs. And then the second step, as you can see here in the column on the right-hand side, would be to select an essay that allows you to monitor that key event so preferably at the activity level rather than at the expression level. 
This is just an example of where we are now in Ontox as we speak for the liver steatosis uh, case study. And you can see on the slide that uh, for the key events on the left-hand side, we distinguish between two types of key events. So the one shown in orange and the ones uh, shown in blue. And why is that? Well, the orange one are really like the, um, the AOP-specific ones. So in the case of steatosis, that would be anything that really relates to liver uh, uh, lipid metabolism. While the blue ones are the more generic ones. So things like uh, mitochondrial impairment, uh, oxidative stress, cell death, these kind of things. And why do we make this distinction? Well, this will allow you in the later on, uh, let's say, testing batteries to exchange assays, which not only will, you know, imply a reduction in, in testing time, but also a reduction in cost. And of course, especially uh, for people in industry, this is of high relevance. All right, and then we did the very same thing, or we are doing the very same thing for the cholestasis case study. So here, same story. You can see that we are now dealing with, um, with six uh, key events. I want to emphasize, by the way, that this, this is absolutely not set in stone. So we are still playing around with the selection of the key events and also with the selection of the corresponding assays in order to uh, maximize, um, let's say, the predictive value. Okay, so if you want to stay informed about uh, Ontox, um, I would suggest you to go to the website. You have a QR code here that will guide you to the website, and there you will also find uh, all of the information of our presence on uh, social media. Uh, we are abundantly present uh, on uh, uh, well, the most relevant social media. And also on the website, there will be an opportunity to subscribe to the newsletter. Thank you very much for your attention.